Thank you to Richard for inviting me to this conference. Uh, he has asked us to address the question of uh, is there a value and what is the value, if so, in discussing or thinking about apocalyptic movements. Uh, I think uh, there's, there's tremendous value in it. Um, and that's because uh, the apocalyptic movements are a major component of modern civilization. Uh, not just um, modern civilization, but modern civilization. Judeo-Christian uh, origins of the apocalyptic uh, movements uh, turn out to be only one set of origins. It's, it's only from reading Richard that I learn about apocalyptic uh, movements uh, that have really no connection to the uh, Judeo-Christian uh, origins or, or, or very feeble connections, uh, uh, the Taiping Rebellion and all, all kinds of things. Uh, uh, so that's thought-provoking. Uh, I, I point out one other aspect of, of apocalyptic thinking which hasn't much come up here, which is that there's a literary history of it. And it's, it's a modern literary history. I think the modern literary history begins with the symbolist poets in the late 19th century. You can see it's, 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 an, ex it's, it's, it's an expression of what lies beyond romanticism. You could see it in Mallarmé, you, and, you, and you see it in uh, Rambeau. In Spanish, you see it in Rubén de Rio. And then it moves from there into the world of philosophy. So I, I think Heidegger is unintelligible. He's uh, unintelligible in any case, but he's really unintelligible if, 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 if you fail to realize that he's speaking about apocalyptic possibilities. And then from Heidegger, and from the literary origins, and from Mallarmé, there's a whole strand of thought, which is the French postmodernist thought, which, in, in which you can see the apocalyptic element yet again. It's, it's there in Derrida, and it's there in Foucault. And it's, 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 it's a big element of what makes these thinkers uh, so exciting. Uh, I, I, I don't think that I think apocalyptic thinking has a place, uh, by the way. I, I'm not against it. I think its place is poetry, and and or it might be in rock music. Um, and it's and, and and when I read it in in when I see it in in Foucault, I think there's a value in it, uh, a, a kind of excitement. But of course, one has to be uh, lucid about these things. In any case. The apocalyptic idea has entered into or has animated all of the great modern totalitarian movements, or what I consider to be totalitarian movements. And the French philosopher André Glucksmann has written, I think, a, a, a marvelous uh, book about this, or he wrote it in the 1990s, called the Ancien Commandement, the Eleventh Commandment. And, uh, in which he, 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 he very eloquently lays out the similarities between the, the political totalitarian movements or the movements that we think of as secular and the religious fundamentalisms so, so that we we're able to see that beneath Nazism and beneath Stalinism uh, lies uh, the same kind of mythology that enters into uh, that derives from the Book of Revelations and other things that we can see in the in the apocalyptic uh, fundamentalist movements. Um, now, I think the value in looking at these things is is, is immense because uh, first it, it yields insights into the movements themselves so that we can we can uh, uh, make sense of them um, uh, more fully, but also it. it frees us from what is a kind of um, default position of in American life, or maybe in modern life as, as a whole, which is to believe that ideological matters or, or matters of the imagination do not really matter. And uh, the, the, the doctrine known as uh, political realism, realism in, in, in quotation marks, uh, you know, a technical term, is really an ideology that stipulates that there are no ideologies. And, 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 and so the tendency on, the natural tendency on the part of so many people is to imagine that whatever 
movement is at hand must be operating on uh, materialist grounds with, with sensible uh, demands and uh, easily comprehended uh, motives. And, and, and therefore, we may not look at the ideological aspects of it. And this is really a serious problem. We had a, we've discussed the Islamist movement uh, at, at length. We had a, some brief, very brief exchanges about Baathism and Saddam Hussein. And uh, I, I point out, I've complained about this for years, that Saddam Hussein wrote many books. He wrote a lot. And very little has been translated. The United States fought two wars against Saddam Hussein without ever taking the trouble to, to read at length what he was saying. And this is, this stems, which, which is crazy on our part, and this stems from this political assumption that there's no reason to read what somebody is saying because we can already project onto this person what his demands must be, what his motivations must be. They must be uh, recognizable, uh, motivations that are recognizable to us. So the value in looking at, at the uh, apocalyptic ideas uh, one of the values is, is just to remind us that, that we shouldn't assume that the ideas that we project on some other movement are in fact the ideas that are motivating that movement. We need to look at what the people are actually saying. So and I commend the various experts here who, who have been um, uh, doing that. Now, uh, uh, we're, we're warned against uh, Attach, assuming that that only Islamic movements uh, are apocalyptic, or that this is a problem uh, having to do only with Islam, but uh, as I've just laid out, of course, there are many variations, secular uh, and sacred, and all the variations of the sacred. Um, still, we do have a problem at hand, uh, which has to do uh, with Islamic movements. Now, I think our conference has illuminated uh, a, double, a double question. One is, uh, we see how little consensus there is, even among uh, the experts who are, who are us, uh, uh, how little consensus there is about basic terminology. Uh, the debate over whether the word Islamism is appropriate is, uh, was and is to me very uh, interesting and illuminating. I, I think it is more than a debate over a, uh, just terminology, because uh, it's not a matter of just finding the right term. It's really a debate over the historical question. Are we seeing movements right now that are fundamentally the same as, as uh, uh, apocalyptic movements of the Islamic past, or are we seeing movements right now that are fundamentally modern? And now, uh, one could come up with a nuanced, nuanced answer, of course, that, that says, yes, there's something of the old in it and also something of the new. But this is the question that has to be addressed. Uh, I have been a partisan of looking at the movements as uh, modern, and, but that's only because when I took the trouble finally to read uh, some of the Islamist authors, I was struck by their modernity. And, and I, was, I was really uh, amazed by it. But I realized that uh, scholars who are looking at it from another angle may, may come up uh, uh, with something else. Anyway, that seems to me a very fertile uh, discussion. And, and it bears on the nature of, of, of the ideas that are uh, motivating people. The other problem that has come up repeatedly in our conference has, is this, which is that there is a, a tremendous pressure on us to avoid having this discussion. And uh, uh, this pressure, the pressure that we're feeling, uh, could not be more dramatic uh, than right now. Uh, the reason why uh, our panel is as stunted as it is, uh, is is only partly to do with food poisoning, uh, but also has to do with terrorism. Our panel has been diminished by fear of terrorism. And we should lucidly uh, remind ourselves that during this, these two days, there have been armed guards outside the door. And uh, this is not a healthy or normal thing for an academic conference. And uh, so this is a very large reality and uh, which, which we should keep in mind always. And it's been the case for many years now. Uh, 
it, it is quite severe. Uh, uh, and uh, that is one of the sources of pressure. But of course, that's only the primary source of pressure. Uh, falling from the primary source of pressure uh, comes the secondary source of pressure, which, which is the pressure on the part of many people uh, who are our friends and our colleagues who warn us that by speaking about these things, we are engaging in a racist act, uh, we are engaging in an oppressive act uh, that, 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 that to speak about Islamist terrorism is, is to express a hatred for ordinary masses of people uh, who are living under oppressed uh, conditions and all this sort of thing. So that we find ourselves under what is, uh, to my mind, a very bizarre accusation. I think that on the contrary, uh, at this conference, uh, 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 we ought to feel, or many of us do feel, a, a complete and thorough solidarity with, with the Muslim victims of the Islamist uh, movement, who are uh, numberless, and uh, the Palestinians uh, uh, to begin with. And uh, since, since the Israel-Palestine uh, situation has come up repeatedly, but not just there. And of course, as we've been reminded by the statistics, that's, that's hardly the major uh, center of, of, of the problem. So we, we're dealing with an oppression that's been, that is felt right now by tens of millions of people, most of whom are Muslims, and, uh, and some of whom are non-Muslims and Christians who are suffering and everyone else. Uh, but we are under a pressure nonetheless not to talk about it, as if we are the ones who are failing to feel the oppression of other people. And so this is, this is a really uh, uh, serious, um, this is a really serious problem. Um, now, uh, I should uh, just ta take one aside to, to speak about Ayan Hirsi Ali, who should be here uh, at, at our, at, in our panel. And I point out to everyone uh, that uh, uh, Ayan, uh, 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 or Ayan Hirsi Ali, Hirsi Ali has, has, has written now uh, uh, three volumes, really, of autobiography, which are a magnificent work, and, and apparently are a work in progress. I, I suspect there are going to be more volumes. And the story that she, t that she tells in, in these volumes is the most extraordinary story you are going to read about someone living in, in, in our moment. And uh, this is a truly heroic work of literature that's being created uh, before our eyes. And uh, so it, it, it's really pitiful that, that we are unable to have her here uh, with us. And it, 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 her appearance here should have been uh, one of the great literary moments of the year at, at, at the university here. And, uh, and we've been prevented from having that moment by the terrorists. So now, uh, What to, what to do about this? Uh, I, I, I think that what to do about the, the problem in talking about this? Uh, I, I have ideas about this, but uh, I've never gotten very far with, with it. We, we, and and as we, we need some kind of alternative structure that's not going to be the universities and it's not going to be the government. Uh, and there should be an alternative intellectual structure. I've, always, I've dreamed for years that, that somebody ought to recreate the old Congress of Cultural Freedom from, from 1950, uh, which, which was the organization of the anti-Stalinist intellectuals uh, in the face of Stalin's uh, uh, tremendous prestige and intellectual prestige uh, in the years following World War II. We need something like that, I think, to talk about the Islamist movement. And it ought to be some kind of institution that would bring together intellectuals and academics uh, uh, from many places, including and especially uh, uh, the Muslim world. And there is no system for bringing together the anti-Islamists of, of, of of different parts of the world. In each of the Muslim countries, there's some great writer. And, uh, uh, you know, we could go across North Africa, identify which country has produced this writer and, and another writer and third writer, and there is no institutional system to introduce these people to each other 
or, or to their colleagues uh, in Europe and, and in the United States. And so uh, th this is a really serious issue, and it's gone on for, our, gone on for years. Now, somebody, uh, some people have pointed out that there's a left-wing crisis in regard to this. I agree, there's a tremendous left-wing crisis. Uh, but, but really, it's not just a left-wing crisis. It's, a, it's an academic crisis, it's, it's, an, it's an intellectual, uh, it's a journalistic crisis. And all in all, I would say uh, the terror crisis is an intellectual crisis. Thank you.